with our very lives. Yeah, that was awesome. Wow. Let's go ahead and pray for this time of the service. Father, we're grateful that you are alive and, and you want to speak to us. Every single one of us, as if we are the only one in the room. So, Lord, we once again ask that you take us by the hand as we look at your word and show us the word made flesh like we've never seen him before. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Now, some of you might wonder why I didn't say Easter. I have nothing against the word Easter except that when I say Easter, a lot of times people think of a lot of other things besides the resurrection. And sometimes we get a little confused about what Easter really is all about. I read a story about a little girl that went to Sunday school, and it happened to be Palm Sunday. And the teacher asked, does anybody know what Sunday today is? And it was one of those classes that one person always raises up her hand. <laughs> and this little girl raised her hand and said, I know, I know, it's Palm Sunday. And the teacher said, right. The teacher then asked, does anyone know what next Sunday is? And the same little girl raised her hand and said, I know, I know, it's Easter Sunday. And the teacher said, that's right. Can anyone tell me what's so special about Easter? And the same little girl raised her hand and said, I know, I know, that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. And the teacher started to congratulate her, but this little girl didn't miss a beat. She went on to say, but if he sees his shadow, <laughs> he has to go back in the grave for six more weeks. <laughs> so when I say Happy Resurrection Sunday, there's no misunderstanding what I'm trying to get across. The resurrection of Jesus is one of the three greatest events that has ever occurred in all humanity. In fact, all three of the, the three greatest events revolve around the person and work of Jesus Christ. And they're hard to rank in terms of importance. But if I was forced to rank them, I would say that the third greatest event was his birth. The second greatest event was his death. But the greatest event of all was his resurrection. Our faith rises and falls on that one event. The resurrection of Jesus is mentioned some 300 times in the New Testament. Currently, on Sunday mornings, we're going through the book of Acts. We're, we're not doing that, obviously, this morning. But the central theme of the book of Acts is that Jesus has risen. Every apostolic sermon, every sermon in the book of Acts has the resurrection as the central theme. Theme. And yet there are some people that will try to discount the resurrection, say it's not that big of a deal. In fact, liberal progressive theology really got its feet on the ground in the early 1900s. There was a German theologian by the name of Rudolf Bultmann, and he tried to say such smooth things like the Bible is not the Word of God, but that it contains the Word of God. Sounds kind of spiritual you know the bible is not the word of god it just contains the word of god until you begin to think through some of the implications if this just contains the word of god well who decides what is and what isn't the word of god i know i know i will and what you often happen are people with their own agenda telling the bible what they want it to say we believe every word out of this book is holy and inspired it is the clearest lens through which we can see Jesus Christ but there are some theologians out there who will say it doesn't matter if Jesus did not rise from the dead the story whether or not it's true or not was meant to inspire us the problem is that's not what the Bible teaches before we look at the resurrection story I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for a moment Whenever I think of the resurrection, I always think of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Every bit of it is about the resurrection. I wish we had time to read through all of it. But let me start reading with verse 12. 
It says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. In other words, I'm wasting my time here. I've wasted my life. Goes on to say, not only that, your faith is also empty. You're wasting your time. You might as well make the best of a bad situation if Christ has not been risen. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. He goes on to say, verse 15, Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. In other words, we're lying. You have no business believing anything we're talking about. Verse 16, for the dead do not rise and Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. One translation says worthless. Doesn't matter how hard you believe. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. Your faith is no better than some guy who just goes out and worships a cow. On top of that, he says you're still in your sins. That's what separates us from God, right? Our sins. We still got a problem. Verse 18, and I think this speaks to every single one of us. Then also those who have fallen asleep, that is, have died in Christ, have perished. Those that you know and love who have died in the faith, they're gone forever. You'll never see them again. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Why? For believing the cruelest hoax ever played on humanity. Now look at verse 20. The very first word is a connecting word. It's a word of contrast. It says, but. In other words, Paul is contrasting everything he just said about what the situation is if Christ has not been raised from the dead. Listen to what he says now. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits. Jesus died the death we all deserve. He rose from the dead. And he graciously shares that victory with every single one of us who puts our trust in him. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even in Christ all shall be made alive. And I wish I had time to read through all of this because it's all good. I encourage you to go home, especially today, to read this whole chapter. He talks about what kind of resurrected body we will have. You ever wonder that? It's going to be an awesome body. It's safe to assume it'll be much like the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. What kind of body did Jesus have? It was a body that was the same, but it was very different. It was recognizable. You'll, you'll read in just a few moments in Luke. It was a body that was able to pass through locked, closed doors. It's safe to assume it's a body that's designed to last forever, that will never get tired, will never get hungry, will never get sick, will never die, right? Now, skip down to the very last few verses of 1 Corinthians 15. He talks about, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, Hades, where is your sting, right? Verse 55, the sting of death, verse 56, is sin, and the strength of sin is a law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we are here this morning. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and turn to Luke 24. We're going to look at the first 12 verses, Luke chapter 24, and we'll look at what happened that glorious day. It says, now on the first day of the week, what day would that be? Sunday, right? One of the reasons we worship together on Sunday is in honor of the resurrection of Jesus. Can you worship on another day? Absolutely. We're not going to be legalistic about that. But on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. If you remember, there wasn't enough time to give Jesus a proper burial before the Sabbath, so they hastily wrapped him up and packed some spices, and they intended to come back Sunday to finish the job. Now look at verse 2. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, we know from Matthew's account, and I touched on this last week, there was an earthquake. A huge angel descends, rolls away the stone, sits on it as if to say, 
You thought this could keep Jesus in the tomb. And the guards, they shook with fear and they fell like dead men. Wow. Which brings up an interesting question. It's easy to get confused because you have four Gospels and some of the Gospel writers highlight different things. And sometimes it seems like the accounts kind of contradict one another. For example, Matthew writes about one angel. John writes about two angels. Luke that we're looking at this morning doesn't even call them angels. He calls them men who are wearing brilliant apparel. And it's easy to think, okay, what is it? Is there a contradiction here? Well, we have some retired law enforcement people here, SIG, way there in the back. Trained police investigators, back me up on this, will tell you if they're investigating a crime or an accident scene and they interview witnesses, if everyone has the exact same story, something's wrong. There's obviously some collaboration that's taking place. They're, they're getting together, making sure their stories match. There needs to be some discrepancy for the story to be true because all of us see things in different ways, in different perspectives, noticing different things. And obviously, Matthew wasn't necessarily saying that there weren't two angels. He was highlighting the angel that came down with a big splash, right? So these stories don't contradict one another. If you really look at them objectively, they reinforce one another. Verse 3. It says how the, the women went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. That's the real issue, the body of Jesus, right? we got to understand that there are a few things that all of us can agree on. Even the enemies of the cross. Everyone involved in the resurrection story were absolutely, totally convinced that Jesus was, in fact, dead. The religious leaders knew that he claimed that he was going to come back to life. Don't you think that they would make sure that he was dead? Absolutely. The Roman soldiers were highly motivated to carry out the sentence because if they somehow failed, they themselves were crucified. And just to make sure, you might remember the story, one of the soldiers, after Jesus was, in fact, dead, walks up with a spear, stabs him in the side, and blood and water flows, which is a sure indicator that he was, in fact, dead. And the disciples were convinced that he was dead. And there are all kinds of crazy, liberal, conspiracy theories that say, well, Jesus really didn't die on the cross. He kind of passed out, and they mistakenly buried him in the tomb. And, you know, in that cold, damp tomb he suddenly came to, managed to roll away a one-and-a-half to two-ton boulder and claim victory over the grave. Everyone was convinced Jesus was dead. And everyone was convinced that the tomb was, in fact, empty. The real question is, what happened to the body? We touched on this last week in Matthew's Gospel, when the guards came to the religious leaders and told them what happened with the angel and the earthquake and the stone rolling away. The religious leaders told the guards to lie. They bribe them. They say, we got your back. We'll make sure you're not in trouble with rum. Just lie. Say the disciples stole the body while you were asleep. Question. If you're asleep, how do you know who stole the body? And not only that, the disciples, they were in no condition to mount a rescue mission to recover the dead body of Jesus. Uh, we'll read in just a few verses. They were behind closed, locked doors fearing the Jews, thinking that they would be crucified next. They were in hiding, okay? All anybody would have to do to put down the whole Christianity movement would be to come up with a dead body. Nobody could. In fact, hundreds of people saw him resurrected, right? Verse 4, it says, And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, in other words, suddenly two men stood by them in shining garments. Come on, they're angels, right? Then as they were afraid, talking about the women, and bowed their faces to the earth, they, talking about the angels, said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? That's a great question, isn't it? Why do you seek the living among the dead? So many people do that today. So many people kind of treat Christianity as some kind of intellectual exercise, as if it's just enough just to believe all the right stuff. Some people study Jesus, right? 
Study him intellectually, philosophically, theologically, as if he's still dead. Others don't deny the fact that Jesus was a historical figure, but they say, oh, he was just a good man, maybe a great teacher, maybe even a prophet of God, but they stopped short of calling him God. C.S. Lewis, who wrote Mere Christianity, said we don't have that option. That he either was a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. Those are the only three options. Maybe he thought he was God and was crazy. Maybe he knew he wasn't God and lied. Or he is, in fact, exactly who he said he is. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Sometimes believers do that. Seek the living among the dead. They, they experience the resurrected Christ. But they go back to the dead things of the world thinking they can satisfy. Augustine writes about how in each human heart there's a hole that only God can fill. A void, if you will. And what we tend to do, I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it before, is to try to fill that void with stuff. And we try and we try to fill it with more stuff, more trinkets, more toys, and yet nothing short of a relationship with Jesus Christ will fill that void. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Look at what else the angel says in verse 6. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Now, don't put up the Matthew verse yet. Okay, let me, let me give you the context. Jesus once asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they came up with a lot of answers. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say one of the prophets of old. Jesus makes it personal and says, who do you say that I am? Remember that? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, right. Well done, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he gives him a new name. Remember that? Peter, which means rock. And he says, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. <laughs> right after that. I mean, right after that. Go ahead and put up the verse, Kevin. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, it says, From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples. This word show in the Greek isn't a one-time thing. It's not like he showed them once and said, oh, I hope they get it. It means he continually showed them. I can think of four times he, he told them, look, I'm going to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and be raised on the third day. He told them that over and over and over again. And it's easy to ask, well, why didn't they get it? Well, in the human psyche, there's something known as normalcy bias. If you're not ready to believe something, if, if, if you don't want to believe something, what happens? You act like it's not going to happen. And that's obviously what happened with the disciples. I mean, things were good. Jesus was with them. What can be better than Emmanuel, God with us? They put that out of their mind. And here in Luke chapter 24, the angel reminds them, and look at verse 8. It says they remembered his words. They're like, oh. And then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And we're told who was there. It was Mary Magdalene. And by the way, John only focuses on Mary. But he doesn't deny that there were not other women there. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told them these things to the apostles. Augustine once wrote that Mary Magdalene, I like this, was the apostle to the apostles. Isn't that good? The word apostle means sent one. She was sent to be the first one to tell the disciples that Jesus has risen. 
Look at the disciples' response, verse 11. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. He believed. He wasn't quite sure what he saw, but he marveled, and he believed. How do I know that? John, in John chapter 20, John makes a point to mention that he was with Peter and that they ran to the tomb. And he highlights the fact that he beat Peter. John was younger. Uh, running is for the young. If you ever see me run, know something's wrong, okay? Uh, there's a joke about it. How, how do you get away from a bear? Well, you run and make sure you're running with someone who's slower than you. John gets there first, but waits for Peter. Peter goes in, according to John, and then John goes in and believes, but obviously they both know something is happening. Now, I want to quickly take you to John chapter 20 because John helps us fill in the gaps. John chapter 20, because right after in Luke, it talks about the two disciples on the road to a man. I really want to get back to the issue at hand. In verse 19, John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father sent me, I send you. And then look at verse 22. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is where they became born again. You say, how do you know that? Well, right here, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. You say, what about Acts chapter 2 and the whole Pentecost thing and the Holy Spirit descending on them? That was about the filling of the Holy Spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is about being empowered for ministry. Where did I leave off? Verse 23. Actually, I don't think I have verse 23, uh, the slide. Let me read it to you. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You know, unforgiveness will really poison your soul. And then verse 24, Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to them, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. So, well done, Thomas, you're still with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side do not be unbelieving but believing and notice thomas doesn't even have to do that look at what he says thomas answered and said to him my lord and my what don't miss that my lord and my god and jesus said to him thomas because you have seen me you have believed blessed are those he's talking about you and me two thousand years later blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe and Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You know, I could spend the next hour trying to prove to you that Jesus rose from the dead. But the real testimony is the disciples what they were like before the resurrection. We just hinted at it. They were anything but bold. They were in hiding. They were depressed. They thought all was lost. What happened after the resurrection? Everything changed. Everything changed. They were bold. They were courageous. We looked at just last week how Peter and John were standing before the Sanhedrin, the very Jewish council Jesus stood before and condemned him to death. And Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, said, This Jesus whom you crucified is alive. 
And then later in Acts, they're like, what are we going to do with these guys? These are uneducated, untrained men, and yet they recognize that they had been with Jesus. In fact, a little later in Acts, it talks about how these guys are turning the world upside down. I would argue to say the world was already upside down because of sin. God sent them into the world to turn it right side up. But that's the real testimony, isn't it? He's come that we might have life. I think of that John chapter 10. I've come that you might have life. And not just life. Life more abundantly. Not just getting by. Not just limping through life. Life the way it was meant to be lived. We've got to understand that we were made by God and for Him. And without Him, nothing in this life will ever make sense. It's crazy today just watching some of the stuff that's happening on the news people are trying to create their own meaning and purpose with their own personal pronouns i mean it's crazy people are trying to conjure up their own meaning it's vanity it's vanity it's all chasing after the wind life will never make sense until you give your life to christ and so many of you have done that Maybe you've done it, and we talked about it before. You're seeking the living among the dead. Maybe you've given your life to Christ, but you're going after the dead things of the world that can't really satisfy. But maybe you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe you thought Christianity was just knowing all the right stuff. And God is working in your life. He's revealing himself to you, and you want Jesus in your life. Well, if that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you to do a very bold thing. Invite him in. You say, how do I do that? It's an act of surrender. Sometimes God has to get us to that place, doesn't he, where we figure out that, man, this life is not working my way. And you surrender. And you say, Lord, would you come into my life? Would you be my life? Would you fill my life with meaning and color and flavor? Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you give me a new start? So I'm going to ask us to do something this morning. I'm going to ask all of us to stand, okay? And I'm going to encourage every single one of us to pray this prayer after me. You say, I already prayed it 10 years ago. That's okay. It's a great prayer to pray. God's not confused saying, oh, I'm really confused. I thought you prayed this prayer 10 years ago. But it's my prayer that someone here will pray this prayer for the first time and give their life to Christ. And by the way, before I forget, we have stuff for you, discipleship, and we have a baptism Sunday coming, so we want to hear about it. But every head bowed, every eye closed, would you repeat after me? Dear Jesus, I give up. You are Lord, and I am not. Would you come into my life and be my Savior and Lord? Would you be my friend? Would you forgive me of my sins and give me a fresh start? In Jesus' name, amen. That's good news, isn't it? And the thing about good news, if it's really good, you can't keep it to yourself. you got to share it. So please share that before you leave. We're going to sing a very simple chorus. Because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Let's sing this together. It's a bad time to put a mint in my mouth. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I that again.
reminder, we have people who would love to pray with you over here. Um, maybe you just want to be a part of the prayer team and join in. Um, come over there. If you gave your life to Christ or if you rededicated your life, I'll be up here as well, and I would love to know about it as well. But let's act like Jesus really rose, okay? Let's act as if he died yesterday, rose today, and is coming tomorrow. Because you know what? He could. He could. Go in peace, serve the Lord. And all the people said, amen. amen.